Hello, my name is Kelly Lawson, your nursing career host, and on behalf of the Center for we are delighted that you are here to join us for the John Hopkins Suburban Hospital Get the Workshop um, with Teresa Pinero. And I will introduce yourself. Um, but before uh, that, I plan to let you know what to expect from today's event. So we will be recording the recording with the slide deck shortly after the event. But we also recommend that all attendees are the best sound quality. So Teresa will spend about 40, 45 minutes providing a recruiter's technical be formal in regards to the nursing recruitment process. In addition to that, she will also go through the strategy your resume and cover letter, as well as And I'm, I want Rachel and Kelly, make sure you can hear me okay as I'm talking. Kelly, you were breaking up ever so slightly, so just give me a thumbs up if I'm clear. Am I clear in my conversation? Whoop, whoop. All right. We're going to talk about all kinds of things. So first of all, I know that this is the weirdest time in the world to be in nursing school with everything being virtual and there's just so much angst out there. But we're going to talk about kind of how to get ready for the next steps in your nursing career, which is to get a job, to graduate, and then how do you sell yourself to somebody when you haven't maybe even stepped foot in their organization or their hospital or the unit that you want to work on. So please, throughout this talk, raise, don't raise your hand. Just unmute yourself and ask me questions because this is, it's about you. I could babble on all day long and that we don't want to necessarily hear that. If you have a specific question, I want to be able to answer that for you. I'm going to be sharing my screen, and I'm going to be sharing some information that we're going to be talking about all the way throughout the presentation. Um, it's pretty cool. Like, literally, we are going to be sharing and talking about a collaborative effort, if you will. Kelly and I put this together. Gosh, we've been doing this now for almost five years, I think. It's been a while. Um, and we finally just sat down and said, you know what, we need to put this together and we need to put it down on paper so that way when we're presenting it to you, you have a takeaway that you could go with you. So you'll notice Kelly's information is up there. We're just going to kind of talk about what this means, what your cover letter means. Before I got on this webinar, I literally was just going through new grad nurse residency applicants because our, our new grad nurse residency is open. And if you're graduating in December, or if you just recently graduated or getting ready to graduate, even if it's not until May, just pay attention to some of these things. Because the things that I found, which still amaze me, um, it's one thing if you're applying to a healthcare system and there's five different hospitals and you want to apply to all of those different hospitals, but you need to customize your cover letter. That's like on the get-go. And we're going to go into deep detail on this types of stuff that will trip you up. So why am I this person who's pontificating to you right now? So I've been a nurse for 28 years. Um, I don't know if all of you actually felt, you know, you knew exactly what you wanted to do when you graduated from high school and went into college, or maybe you've had a different career path. I had no idea and no clue, and medicine was at the very probably bottom of my list. It wasn't even in my in my purview, if you will. I went in the Air Force when I was 17 years old. I wanted to be a spy, <laughs> and and I ended up in an open general category where I became a diet therapy tech, and that was my introduction to the hospital. Many twists and turns later, I eventually became a nurse. I've been a nurse now for 28 years, but in 2005, I had the opportunity to kind of try on nurse recruitment. I, I have done everything. 
except work in med surge. Um, I've worked in small ICUs, large ICUs. I've done hospice nursing. I did cancer outreach education, um, doing grant programs. I worked with pain management, wound care. I went for, to work for a biotech company. I worked for a big bad pharmaceutical company. The door is wide open to being a nurse. You can do anything. Now, yes, you need to kind of stay in a job and get some skills as you go through, but I never would have said 28 years ago that I was going to be a nurse recruiter and talking to you all now. That would have never been at, at, at the front of my ideas of what I wanted to do as a nurse. My ideas were, were simple. I was going to be an ICU nurse, and I wanted to be a flight nurse in the military. Flight nurse in the military was easy. I was already slated for that job when I graduated. I, um, I was already in the Air National Guard unit that I was in, and they said you could go work in the clinic or you can go fly on the back of C-130s. Well, that was a no-brainer. Um, so I did that. But I actually did 23 years in the Guard and Reserve total, so I retired in 2006. But from being an ICU nurse, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I wish I could see your all's faces, but I know I can't, and that's okay. But there are probably a lot of you like, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to do ICU. Or maybe some of you are like, but wait, what's wrong with med surge? Nothing. Um, you could do anything you want as a nurse, and you need to find a nurse residency that will help support that. There are hospitals that will have amazing residency programs where they're going to really help shepherd you from being this novice, new graduate nurse into being the nurse that you know you will be at some point in time. There are other hospitals and other, not just hospitals, but healthcare organizations, could be a subacute, could be assisted living, could be public health, where they might just throw you to the wolves. So you got to figure out what that looks like and when to run away. Because I will tell you, you don't want to have a disaster for your first job as a nurse. You want to go somewhere where you're going to get that, the caring, the nurturing, and the people that really care about your success as a new grad. Um, things have changed a lot over the years. We really want all of our new graduate nurses to be as successful as they can be. So that's why I'm talking to you. I've been in recruitment since 2005. Um, I'm connected throughout the country with other healthcare recruiters. If some of you are looking to relocate or move to the an, another area outside of the DMV or even within the DMV, I know practically all of the recruiters. And I'm like, it's not like it's a, a a funny thing that I know them is I'm on the board, I'm actually the president-elect of the National Association of Healthcare Recruiters Association. So it's because of that association um, affiliation that I know everybody. So I'm happy to connect the dots for you. And I'm actually also going to look here. I don't think it's, it's not going to be on this at all, but I feel like I want to make sure at the end of this, Kelly or Rachel, if you could put my name in, in uh my email address so that people can reach out to me. I want to make sure that you can reach out to me. And I'm happy to review your resume or cover letter. You've already got a great team with Kelly and Rachel, but I could give you the perspective of somebody who actually does this every day for a living. So happy to be that third person part of this bigger GWU team that can help you out. And don't be afraid if it's not at one of the Johns Hopkins hospitals that you don't want to work for. I'm not here representing Hop. Well, I am here representing Hopkins. I'm here, though, for your best interests. Um, I can tell you, if you want to work at labor and delivery, you're not going to be working at Suburban. If you want to do peds, you're not going to be at Suburban. We're we're all about more about cardiac trauma, and we've got a great ortho program, but we just don't deliver babies here unless it's by accident and it's in the emergency department. So about those cover letters. Again, this morning, I was literally going through all of our applicants. And yeah, of course, they're going to apply to other hospitals within the Hopkins system, especially if they live somewhere close to another hospital besides mine. But what I don't like to see, and specifically what my managers really don't like to see, is that you don't, you don't make it very customized to that hospital. Worse yet is if you actually put something like, oh, I really, really want to work at Suburban, and then in the next line, you're talking about GWU or Georgetown or Washington Hospital Center, we're just not really going to look at you as a candidate if we don't have that attention to detail. So you have to have that attention to detail. Um, so really customize it, right? Know your audience, research, the research, display your enthusiasm, try to address it if you possibly can. You know, Again, like I said, Kelly, I feel like I'm talking from my own work. That's because Kelly and I did this together, so it's wonderful. So we're going to show you a letter. 
and we're going to talk. If you don't have the, the street address of the company, don't worry about it. If you have a title of a person, even if it's a recruiter, that's fine. Otherwise, you can put, you know, to the nursing leadership at Suburban Hospital or at Simply Hospital or at Washington Hospital Center. Um, what, what are you doing? Why are you here? Why are you interested? Always include a cover letter if you can. You can always submit a cover letter, and if you're at a website or an applicant tracking system is the behind the scenes term for it, but if you're on somebody's website and it doesn't look like you can do anything but upload one document, attach your cover letter to your resume and maybe PDF it and upload it that way. That's the easiest way to get in there. But you really want to have, like, the why. Like, why should we be looking at you? Um, you know, why, if you want to work in oncology, do you want to work at Sibley? And maybe you're just maybe you've got that story, right? Like, why do you want to be a nurse? Why do you want to be an oncology nurse? Why do you want to be an ICU nurse? Maybe you had a family member. Maybe you've been a patient. Maybe you've been working as a patient care tech in one of those units. Or maybe you just think it'd be kind of cool, right? Maybe you're a trauma junkie and you want to work in the ED. I don't know, but make sure you can articulate that. Have your story, but make it brief, right? Um, it's one thing to go on and on and on and on and on, but not in your cover letter. That needs to be brief, succinct, and to the point that it needs to capture our interest. So you want to make sure you have attention to detail. You want to make sure you have the name of the company accurate and correct. And you want to make sure that you kind of tell us the why behind things, right? So you could see all of these different types of things, the introduction, the body, and then like a third paragraph talking about the kind of relative skills that you have. I will tell you, if you want to say something like, I have leadership skills, don't just tell me, oh, I have these great leadership skills. Show, give me a, a line or two in your cover letter as to why you have great leadership skills. I was the president of the, the Nursing Student Association. I led three projects in my group for studying. I took on this. I did that. And it doesn't always have to be clinically related. Maybe you actually were in a different career path and you were a manager in that other career that you had. Those transferable skills we'll talk about with your resume, um, there's nothing wrong with using those within your cover letter as well. So I'm gonna pause for a second and I want people to participate. So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and you can ask a question. People are quiet. I, they don't have the capability of unmuting themselves. They have. They can only ask questions in the Q and A. Oh, do we have any questions in the Q and A? None that have come through right now. Perfect. Okay. Well, then we'll just keep going. All righty then. So, when you're closing out your cover letter, you want to make sure that you you kind of close the deal, if you will, on the cover letter. Give them a reason to want to call you back. And, you know, I keep talking about cover letters. You guys are probably like, oh, nobody really uses cover letters, do they? Nobody reads these things. We do. I literally just took probably 10 people out of the running for our, for our uh, nurse residency program here at Suburban in our step-down unit, our cardiac step-down unit, because they had a cover letter that wasn't addressed to anybody at Suburban. And they were talking about one of the other Hopkins hospitals, and they didn't have the attention to detail to make a cover letter that's unique to me. One of them was talking about peds, and I'm like, yeah, do you think I'm gonna share that with my director of critical care services to say, hey, this person really wanna work for you, when they obviously don't as evidenced by their cover letter. So just really think through this, have the story, make sure, um, oh, and I love that question. So somebody just actually asked a question about as a veteran, Yes, first of all, for all of you veterans, and I know GWU does a great job with working with veterans um, coming through the military, from the military, and, and becoming nurses. That's awesome. Thank you all for your service. And you absolutely can use that information. Yes, absolutely. All right, I'm going to read through this real quick. Like, um, so with how much of that military experience would you, would you include? You know, you can just say, during my time in the military, and if you were maybe a medic or if you were whatever role you were in, um, 
I was in charge of, I had supervisory responsibility over 30 people. I feel like this, in addition to X, Y, Z, make me a great leader or make me, you know, a solid professional who really understands what it's like to be committed to something like this nurse residency program. What you're trying to convey to them is you're really trying to convey to them that you're going to stay, you're going to stick with them, and you're going to be a great part of their team. So however you can articulate that. Um, and it's not, a, and actually, let's see, is it, uh, here's another one. For new grads, is it frowned upon to apply for two positions that are not specifically titled new grads? So here's what I will say about that. If you read a job posting and it says RN or RN2, or it's asking for a certain level of experience that is more than being a new grad, do not apply. You will annoy us completely. <laughs> it's not good to do that. Uh, I, we don't, we don't have time for that. When we see somebody's apply to our ICU for one of our experienced ICU RN positions, we get all excited. And then if we see it's a new grad, we're like, ugh, can't they read? So please don't do that because if it's the same recruiter looking at the new grad residency as looking at the other applications for the experienced nursing positions, you're going to frustrate them. And you're going to kind of show them already that you don't have great attention to detail because you're, paying, you're applying for jobs that you don't qualify for. So please don't do that. Great question. <laughs> um, so cover letter, if we don't have any other questions about that, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about the resume, which is really important. That's the next thing that that we're going to just chit chat about. All right. So the resume, you know, I know that it says that we should have one or two pages. Um, hang on a second. One. There we go. One or two pages. Now we say one or two pages. One or two pages is great if you've got wonderful content. If you're filling it with fluff, and fluff is just like all of your volunteer activities because you actually don't have any work experience. Well, then you need to carve that down to one page. If you're filling it with um, clinical information and you're going to tell me in great detail all of the clinical experiences that you've had, that is what I would call fluff. So you want to be really cautious of that. Now, having said that, my military folks, my people that have had another career, another job, another lifetime before you decided to become a nurse, there is nothing wrong with putting that in there. Um, transferable skills, right? So there, I'm sure, and this is where I really wish we could talk, um, people that have worked, we're going to give you an example of a resume to look at. It's a whole lot of stuff. Oh, my goodness, I love this. Okay, so you're going to see work experience here. So waitress, hmm, has a waitress or a server or a barista or a nan or or anybody in the service industry, uh, could be retail, could be in the restaurant industry, it could be in the, like I said, the coffee space, the barista industry. Has anybody ever dealt with a difficult customer? Do you know how to resolve customer complaints? Yes, you do. That's a transferable skill. One of my favorite new hires uh, has always been somebody who's been a Starbucks barista because, man, can you multitask? And, and you go through the guest training at Starbucks, so you've got great customer service skills. At the end of the day, we know that you're a new grad. We know that you don't know that much of anything unless you maybe were a medic or something in the military. You're coming in at ground zero pretty much with everybody else. We want you to want to be eager to learn. We want you to have great customer service skills because the world is filled with reviews and HCAP scores and our patients have choices unless they're usually brought in by the emergency department, but they have by the ED, by an ambulance, but they have choices. They can go anywhere to be treated. And if they're choosing to be treated at your hospital, they want great customer service. They want you to be kind. They want you to be nice. They expect you to save their lives. That's a given. But they do expect you to be nice as you go through. So we look for that. We can literally look for that. Like we have a 10-5 rule here at Suburban, right? If you're within 10 feet, you smile. Hard to do, but you can still smile even behind your mask. Within five feet, you say hello. It breeds 
a feeling of warmth and it becomes real. It's not like you just have to do it. It becomes who you are. So when you're in this world of customer ser service and consumer options, same thing goes with hospitals. All people have options. So we want to make sure that we're hiring you for great, great skills that are beyond just the clinical skills that you've learned. So please don't be afraid to put your work experience. Um, the waitress, you know, excelled, received the highest tips that shows great customer service. Um, if you were a CNA or a nurse tech or something like that, do we need you to put all of the things that you did as a CNA or as a nurse tech? Do you need to tell me that you emptied Foley catheters? Do you need to tell me that you did eyes and nose or vital signs? No, you don't. We know what you do as a CNA, um, but what do we want to hear? Maybe we want to hear that you actually trained new people. That could be for the waitress job or the CNA job. Maybe you trained other people. What does that show? That shows that you were, A, probably a really excellent worker, and you could teach other people. All these things are really good for nursing, and that's why you were chosen. So we want you to show results. And I'm sure if you read through, there's a lot of pages here that talk about kind of what you need to do. That is key. It's just like, what have you achieved? What were your results? Not necessarily the tasks that you have done. I will preface that and then say, if you were a medic or some sort of a medical professional in the military, you can put in actually a little bit more detail about some of the things that you did, not necessarily task by task, but the types of care you provided and the level that you provided in. Because a lot of folks aren't used to the military. Um, I could tell you I many times when I was a flight nurse flying out of Howard Air Force Base in Panama in the 90s, I'd go into the middle of a jungle and it was an enlisted guy who everybody called Doc and he was basically an army medic that was splinting, was doing all kinds of really cool things. He was setting brakes on broken legs. And I mean, he was enlisted. He wasn't a doctor. He wasn't a nurse. He wasn't a PA, but everybody called him Doc. So does he bring a skill set if he wanted to go back and become a nurse? Absolutely. So, so that to me would be the exception is if you've actually done those types of things. So you'll notice here clinical rotations. You see how short and sweet that is? So in the world of catching our attention and catching it quickly, I don't necessarily need to see the great detail of what you did in your clinical rotations. A lot of us, a lot of us people in nurse recruitment are nurses, and even if we're not, we're used to this, we know what you do, we get it. And even if you're in a virtual environment, you can put in parentheses probably virtual, and we'll talk about this whole virtual world that you're in right now, what that means from a job perspective, but make sure you do include it. Do you need to list every single clinical experience you ever had? Not necessarily. I would start with the most recent at the top and then work your way down. But I will tell you this, if you are wanting to work, uh, let's use an example. Well, we could use this one as an example. So this person's got PEDS, community nursing, OB, med surge, psych, and geriatrics. It will have anything to do with the emergency department or the OR or the ICU. But maybe that's where you really want to work. Maybe you had the opportunity, pre-pandemic probably, to have a shadow, and you had a shadow day, or you were a nurse extern, and you got to be in an ICU, the OR, or the ED. I would put that up here. I would put, if you're a paid extern, you could put it on the work experience, but I'd also include those clinical hours up there as well, because that's going to grab our attention. A lot of hospitals, Johns Hopkins Hospital, Suburban Hospital, if you haven't necessarily done a rotation or had a capstone or some hours in the department that you're applying for, they might not look at your resume. So that can also be part of your story too in your cover letter. So let's say you did a two day shadow. You had the opportunity to shadow two different days, two different emergency departments and boom, lightning struck. Wow, I wanna be an ED nurse. That's your cover letter story. Because maybe you thought you wanted to be an OBGY, you know, like at work on a, a mother baby or labor and delivery, and all of a sudden the ED came in, and you're like, this is my life. This is what I think I want to do. So then I would put that clinical rotation, and I wouldn't necessarily put, I wouldn't put, for the hours, I would just put a two-day shadow instead of a number, and then you could articulate that out in your cover letter. I'm going to pause again. Any, any questions coming through in the Q&A, Kelly or Rachel? 
Just one other question. Uh, someone asked specifically about cover letters and how not to sound when you are writing your cover letters, specifically about bills and things like that. How do you kind of uh, go with that fine line of sounding? Sure. So you don't want to be boastful, right? I think that's what you were saying. You break, you do break up a little bit, Kelly, when you're talking. But um, with that cover letter, it, you know, a good, a good, um, a good review for your own cover letter is write it and then go back and kind of look at the number of times you could almost circle them, if you will, the number of times you say the word I, I want this, I, my career, me, 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 I, I, I. So you got to be careful with that because you want to come across as, yes, I've done these things and I'm really proud of these things and I'm excited. Those are the good eyes, right? But if it's all about my goals, my career, my, 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 and it doesn't say anything about the organization and what you're going to give back. So let's, as an example, you know, if selected to be in the nurse residency program at fill in the blank hospital, um, and once I am trained, I will do my very best to deliver the excellent care that your organization is known for. Um, I can't wait to be part of a team. So that sounds really like, wow, and genuine, and you're part of this group, versus my goal is becoming a CRNA, and I really want to work in the ICU so I can get this years of experience, and, and I want to do this, and I want to go there, and I want to do this. Just watch that, because we do get cover letters that are all about the I and not about kind of the we, so that's going to come across, and it could rub people the wrong way. My, my hiring managers and most hiring managers out there, you know, we do, like I said, we do read these things, and we review these things, and they take note. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting with the resume, you'll notice that we don't have, um, we don't have an objective statement. Objective statements will trip you up quicker than anything. You write this beautiful cover letter. And then in your objective, your cover letter is for, I don't know, uh, Inova Loudon Hospital. But then in your objective statement, you put Virginia Hospital Center. Well, you've just nixed yourself from an interview. And if you leave that at both of the hospitals that you've applied for, then they're both going to be pretty frustrated with you. So objective statements can trip you up. If you don't want to do a cover letter, I guess that's your choice. We highly encourage them. But I would avoid objective statements. They're not, it's, it's kind of that fluff that I was talking about. We really don't need to see it because you're not going to tell us anything in the objective statement that you didn't already tell us in the cover letter. And it's a great place for you to trip yourself up if you don't, you know, um, correct the name of the hospital that you're applying to. So you'll notice here this list we've got like in no particular order, but education's fine. People are going to want to know. Um, and yeah. They're going to want to know what your GPA is. We, some organizations are really big on it. Others are not. You'll notice here we've got two different degrees listed. That's fine, too. But I will caution you this. If you've gone to different schools to do prereqs, please don't list those. I don't need to see the six community colleges that you've attended over the years to get prereqs done for your nursing program or for whatever program you were completing. I want to see a completed degree, even if it has nothing to do with nursing, that's fine. Um, I hired somebody once who had a PhD in music. It was something about, she was like a, a, music, a musical engineer, and she went to Princeton. And I was like, what? But then when I read her resume, I was like, oh, okay, it makes sense. She had like this whole career, and then she decided to become a nurse. So, And it was, it was pretty awesome. It was pretty fascinating. So I think that's fine. You can have those other degrees. But just don't list out degrees or colleges, sorry, not degrees, but colleges that you've attended that you just did prereqs on. I really don't need to see that. And we, you're, now you're filling up space again that we don't need to see. So education, clinical experience, you'll notice, um, you know, I like this. We've got it highlighted where we talk about the ICU. If you're applying to the ICU, this clinical preceptorship, it's pretty awesome that you could list that out and highlight it, and then you could talk about the rest of your clinical rotations. Again, spending time on what it is you're applying for. Work experience, yes, you can put all of your work experience. We've already talked about that. Leadership and involvement, skills and certifications. So, you know, things like being a part of the American Nurses Association, 
if you've got a chapter or a local chapter to like maybe you wanted to be an ED nurse and you joined as a student the ENA um, local chapter in your area, but you're a student, still put that. That's huge for an ED nurse or an ED hiring manager to see that on your resume. That shows that you went above and beyond and people really do like to see that. I'm going to pause again just to make sure we don't have any questions floating out there. Kelly, are we, are we doing all right? There's one question because on that note, if we if we are say a handful of classes shy of an additional BS in a different field, can we put that to the degree? I wouldn't. It's not really applicable. Um, no, I mean I'm, unless it's near and dear to your heart, I really don't see that you need to put that because we just want to see complete degree programs that you've had. Yeah, that's a good question though. Thank you. So skills and certifications, um, I will tell you this, hopefully none of you are going to go out and do any virtual ACLS classes or PALS classes or TNCC classes. First of all, you might not be eligible to do all of them, but we don't want you to spend money on something that you really don't have any practical knowledge of. Maybe you're a paramedic and you've done ACLS training. That's different. But if you went out and just took an ACLS, ACLS class to put it on your resume, You've spent money on something that you really don't have any practical application of at this point in time. Because if you have it, the manager's going to say, oh, well, then tell me about this rhythm and what do you do and what's the treatment? And then you're going to get tripped up. <laughs> so just put the basics. Um, you know, electronic health records, I, I would say they're fine to put on there. Um, but again, we're going to teach you. You might be, you might have Epic under your belt but it might just be different and it's a different deliverable. So you can either put that or not put that. We showed this example that you could put it out and that's fine. With your languages that you speak, um, you'll notice that we said conversational in Spanish. Um, if you speak another language and you are fluent in it, we want you to put it. We have such a diverse group of people here in the you know, DMV area that it's important that we address all of the language. So I've had people that have put native Spanish, you know, fluent English, German, Italian, um, you know, conversational Farsi. So like whatever it is, don't be afraid to list all of those things out. Those are all assets. We love to see all of that. All right, we're going to keep scrolling down. Oh, and this is kind of a, a variation. And I think, I think Kelly has shared this with y'all maybe once more than once. Um, this just kind of talks a little bit about outside of the metro area and how you how you can change things up a little bit so people can be more aware of who you are like they might not know george washington university although i think they would it's a pretty amazing school so let's she just gives you some examples just changes it up a little bit different kind of gives you a better understanding of kind of what you've done and then this is one that's tailored to the specific settings you can again see Kind of, if you want to be an L&D, maybe you're applying at Washington Hospital Center, well, then this is where you're going to highlight that for sure. So we've given you all kinds of examples. It's kind of wonderful that we've done this. Um, and you just need to kind of look at it. And again, if you have questions about your resume, I'm happy to look at them to be that third person. Um, Kelly and Rachel are your, are your, are your go-tos, but I'm happy to always look just to give you kind of my recruiter's feedback. And if there are no questions on that, well, then we're going to kind of talk about interviewing. Okay, so here we go. So now you've made it, you've got the interview. It could be virtual. It could be in person. We're starting to do in-person um, interviews. We're, pre we're finding really big conference rooms, and you could still be looking at a panel of people socially distanced, which is even more awkward than just having a panel of people um, looking through a computer screen. But be prepared either way. I will tell you at our organization, um, we actually do a one-way video interview as a first screen. So we send you a link. We send you an email. We tell you what you're going to do. And then we send you a link to a one-way video interview. You'll have a video of us asking you questions. It's not live. It's recorded. And then you'll have like 30 seconds to look at it, the question. And then you have to answer it, and you have like two minutes. So be ready for that, um, and be dressed. 
for be dressed. Be dressed for the interview. And I'm not talking just your top either. I've seen some funky people knock over their computer and then you find out they're wearing their pajama bottoms for their for their pants. So let's be really cognizant of that if you're at home doing an interview. The other thing that you want to do, and this is applies for either in person or um, on a video interview platform, be really cognizant of interruptions. If you're at home, super important. I had a gal that was doing a one-way video interview and she had her earbuds on. You could tell she was sitting in the dark in the living room. Probably the only, you know, it was probably late at night, only time she could actually do it in a busy schedule. And she was just trying so hard to focus on the questions. And all of a sudden I heard the snoring. I think somebody had fallen asleep on the chair and you could hear them snoring. And it's like, am I going to ding her for that? Absolutely not. Was she flustered and distracted? Yes, she was. So just be really cognizant of that. I've seen people do it in their car because it's the only quiet place they have, right? Because inside there's kids, there's all, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, but just be ready, be prepared as you can. Try to be in as quiet of a place as you can with no distractions. Um, your phone's going to want to go off. It's going to buzz at you. Another distractor, huge distractor, is if you're wearing an Apple Watch or any kind of a – I have a Fitbit that notifies me if I get a phone call coming in or if I have a text message. And inevitably, I can't help myself, I look. So I'm looking down, and then I'm looking, glancing over at my phone to see that my mom's called me four times in the last few minutes. Now I'm worried about my mother. So you're going to get distracted. Take the phone off, or take the watch off, take the device off. Uh, you know, so for goodness sakes, mute your phone anyway. But I will tell you, you get tripped up in an in-person or even on a video interview when you've got something buzzing on your wrist and you can't help but look down because we're so attached to our phones and our watches and all of the devices that we have. So make sure you take those off and aren't like paying attention to them at all, literally get them out of the space. I'm gonna pause for a quick second. Any comments or questions there so far? One question. Uh, so as the already has notifications, should I include the fact or not? I, I didn't hear you, Rachel. You were breaking up just a little bit. You could chat that to me, or you could repeat it just more softly, I guess. That's the other thing. See, sometimes you can't hear people. It's kind of funky. Uh, I'll try repeating it. So as the who already has the I should include that or not? Yes, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And Teresa, this is Kelly. I've also put in Sure. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. How important are resume gaps? For instance, I've worked in healthcare for 10 years, decided to go to nursing school and quit my primary job. Good or bad idea to include a PRN non-pertinent job during this time? Um, I think that, you know, again, your past careers don't have to be healthcare. They don't have to be, and, and how you, what you consider pertinent or non-pertinent, every job is pertinent. You could be a nanny, you could be a babysitter, you could be a domestic engineer, which is a stay-at-home mom or dad, and that's still pertinent because you have transferable skills. So I would say that for your resume, that if you quit your primary job, but you've been working, you put that job down. That's important. Um, it shows people that you're you're able to multitask going really to school, and you're still maintaining a job while you're going to school. I think that's important. All right, so then, yes, for the paramedic or any certification, if you're actively using it, and if it's something you've got experience that is on your resume about, please put those certifications. Absolutely, for sure. And Kelly, I like this format. You could just put this in chat. It'll pop up and I could see it. I'll leave it right here. So don't send me any little sneaky notes, but you could put any questions in there and it'll all work out just fine. So again, anything from the resume that you think about as we're going through this, but then we're gonna kind of, we're moving into the interview process. So let's say you're in person and you're on a video interview. Again, what you wear is important. Um, Ladies, I'm just going to, well, I, it could be ladies or gentlemen, but things like your nails, making sure that you don't have the acrylic nails that I'm wearing. Um, the acrylic nails that I'm wearing are just 
because I'm not at the bedside anymore. So make sure that you're not wearing those because you can't wear those at the bedside and you're gonna to have to take them off eventually. Let's get ready and take them off now as you're preparing for those interviews. Uh, I think that I think that you have to be cognizant of colognes and scents and perfumes. Um, I literally had somebody come in and I was training somebody to interview and it was a CNA interview and she came in the door we shut the door and I almost threw up because the smell of vanilla was just like wafting through the room. And the, Amanda, this gal I was, was training, she just looked at me and I looked at her and I looked at the candidate. I said, now is a good time to talk about our scent free policy. And she was like, I'm not wearing any perfume. This is like Victoria's Secret body splash in vanilla. And I had to explain to her that, you know, that nauseating vanilla smell is still a scent and you can't wear it. Um, she was also the same person who had on these really long acrylic nails that were just disgusting. And she'd come from a nursing home and because she still had her scrubs on and I started talking to her about infection control and how you shouldn't have long nails. And when she said, oh, but my patients love it when I scratch their back, I, I think the both of us just about gagged and we tried to maintain our composure. We were like, oh, Okay, now I've got I've touched somebody with MRSA, so you know we need to go sterilize right now. So you have to just be really, really um, ugh, be careful with those things as you're going into interview. Guys, get a suit, get a suit, get a suit, get a suit. Um, even if you're doing a video interview, it's nice to have on a jacket, a shirt, and a tie. It's going to look good. It's going to present well. Ladies, if you're doing, um, you know, have a dress, have on a, sh a nice shirt. Um, for the shirt, we're going to say, make sure that the shirt is not showing me anything that I really don't want to see unless I'm out on a date. And I'm going to pause on that one because you all know what I'm talking about, ladies. So I only say these things, and I know I'm being recorded, but it's true. It happens. Sometimes I have people that come in for interviews, and you're trying to stare at their eyes, but there's there's, there's things out there that are drawing their attention away from the, looking them in the face. So just try not to do that, okay? <laughs> I wouldn't mention this time and time again, but inevitably at least twice a year we get somebody who does that. So that's why I mention it. I'm going to pause and look at some questions. Let's see, we had a question about if you precept it on the floor that you're applying to, should you mention the people that work with you on that unit or keep it focused on what you learned? Oh. There's your story. On the cover letter, um, my time spent with Teresa Mazzaro. Oh my God, she was the best preceptor and she really encouraged me to apply or she inspired me so much that I wanted to apply to this particular department. Absolutely, absolutely mention those folks. So we've talked about clothing, we've talked about um, piercings. Even on a video interview, we could see your piercings. So you really shouldn't have them. There's going to be some safety concerns anyway, but we're going to remove all the piercings from around our eyes, our nose. We don't need big wooden pegs or plugs or whatever they're called in your ears. We don't want to have a ton of earrings. We want to keep things very simple and professional. If you have tattoos, if I was in person, I'd be showing you my tattoo on my leg right now. Cute little gecko, sweet as can be. But if I was interviewing, I'd probably be covering it up. Uh, is that kind of weird, like double standard-ish? Yes or no, but a lot of organizations are going to make you cover up your ink. Just be prepared for that. It, we're not saying it's good, bad, or otherwise. You just have to think about the patient population that you are serving, and sometimes they're ultra, you know, conservative in their ways and thinking, and they're, they're older than us, obviously. So just think through that. Cover up your ink if you have to. You do what you got to do. Um, and you might have to be prepared that you might have to cover that up like while you're working every shift. Our organization is not so um, concerned about that, but there are hospitals and healthcare systems that you literally cannot show any tattoos while you're interviewing. So that's kind of a bummer, but it does happen. You're going to get into the interview, whether it's a video interview or whether it's in person, and inevitably you're going to, you're going to like, freeze. You think you have all kinds of great questions, like you can see here, like comprehensive lists and all about practicing, but we will be asking you these sort of situational behavioral based interview questions. Tell me about a time when, um, and there's, I love this. This is like a great guide. This is six pages of things that you really should be looking at. So 
but you're going to hear these stories like the you're going to hear these you know three strengths weaknesses um and these are actually kind of more one way but what we're typically asking a lot of is like the tell me about a time these behavioral based interview tell me about a time when and even it's like tell me about a time when you made a mistake what was the situation and we'll let it pause right there but what we want to hear from you is tell me about a time you made a mistake i made a mistake when and we're not talking about the the, the menu item you ordered or the clothes that you bought online and had to return we're talking about an honest to goodness mistake. I took too many classes this last semester and I had to drop two of them and so it pushed my graduation date out. You know, I learned that I can't overextend myself. So we're looking to hear what the mistake was, what you did about it. And then we also wanna hear what you're doing for the future to not actually repeat that mistake. Hope that makes sense. Um, oh yeah, how would you recommend answering where do you see yourself in five years? I would say that you don't wanna say, oh, I can't wait to put my two years in here and then go off to CRNA school. What I would say is in five years, I really hope that I can become, and, and you know, there's, there's lots of different, there's the novice to expert theory about nursing. You can say within five years, I hope that I'm the person who's actually sitting on an interview panel, interviewing, other new grads and I'm precepting and maybe I'm a charge and maybe I could really help shepherd other new people into the career path. I think no matter where you are, even if it's not that unit or if it's not that uh, specialty, you would hope to aspire to something like that. So you notice how that's such a safe answer. I hope to be helping and shepherding other new grads into the world of nursing within the next five years. I hope that I could be that preceptor that makes a difference in the new grad's life. I hope that I can become that functional expert and that go-to that people wanna to talk to. You notice I didn't say anything about, I wanna be on this unit, I wanna go into this specialty, I wanna go get an MT, you know, master's degree. We just talked about the best nurse you could be in sharing your passion. Feel free to use that, you can use my, my answer. There's nothing wrong with it. I give that to you for free. <laughs> um, so have some of these things written down. It'll be a little bit more awkward if you're in, in a live video interview, but you could still preface it by saying, even if you're in person, you can say, you know, I knew I was gonna be nervous. I wrote some things down. I'm just gonna take a look at my notes real quick while I try to give you the best answer because I knew I, I wanted to be prepared. Nobody's gonna ding you for that. You'll notice I just kind of sat myself up in the chair. And with the one-way videos, especially, I love when I see this. People just start kind of turning back and forth and they're moving around in their chair because they can't stand sitting still and they're super nervous. Just be really careful of that. You don't want to have too much movement, um, especially if it's not a live video. Live videos, we expect you to be animated, right, and smile and have all of those things. So. The other thing is don't be afraid to ask questions of the interview team, right? So for the interview team, these are perfect questions. I know because Kelly and I put them together, uh, put them together for you. So yeah, how long have you worked here? What do you love about it? What would you change? Um, other questions that you can ask. Um, do we have it listed? We don't. Love this. So, uh, how many travelers are on your unit right now? That's kind of an important question because if the if their hospital has more than 50, the unit you want to work on is like 50% travelers, that's kind of scary to me. You've got to figure out the why behind it. If if the leadership and the nursing staff are all less than a year, I'd be a little bit nervous about that too. Um, you know, what training opportunities and educational opportunities are there? That's a great question to ask. Love this part. If I were hired at the end of a year, if I exceeded your expectations, what would I have achieved? What would I have accomplished? So what are the next steps? What's gonna happen? What's the timeline? You know, there might be some shadow opportunities. A lot of hospitals are sort of opening up. It depends upon the, the unit. We are not doing shadows in our ED at all, period, end of paragraph. We just can't. Um, our ICU just opened up to do some shadows literally in the last 
couple of weeks, but we're monitoring it every day because we're trying to keep all of our COVID patients in one particular spot. We're down pretty low in our numbers right now. Hopefully it stays that way. Um, but what not to ask during the interview? Don't ask about pay. Don't ask about contracts. Don't ask about benefits. That's what you have that conversation with the recruiter about. I'm also going to tell you something else, too. When you're talking to the recruiter, um, do stones. Yeah, we already talked about a lot of this after the interview. Um, so you could talk to the recruiter and you could ask questions. Um, that's fine. Just don't ask it on the middle of the interview panel. Be more focused about the unit and that department and what that means to you working there and how they welcome new grads. That's what it's really all about. So you're going to get job offers. You're going to get many job offers. So I, it's an exciting time, even if it is a virtual sort of world that you're living in right now and trying to get to school with. But you will get job offers. So I'm going to give you some advice on that. You are going to hear things like, oh, we're going to give you, you know, I don't know, $35 an hour. Well, no, probably not. Maybe more like $30 an hour or $31 an hour. And that's going to sound great. And then they're going to say, oh, but you have to pay for parking. So you have to get on a shuttle. You park your car someplace far away. You get on a shuttle. You take the shuttle down to the hospital. And you have to pay for that spot that's far away. And the parking's $12 a day. And there goes your dollar an hour gone with the parking. So mm -hmm. it seems silly, but those are big deals, right? I mean, you just have to ask questions. Maybe parking, maybe they have a metro subsidy, and maybe you can metro to work. That's a better option for you. Maybe, maybe not. Um, is it a union, a collective bargaining agreement? Do you have to pay union dues? You know, or what's the cost of the insurance? Fifty cents an hour, a dollar more an hour sounds great until you start adding in all of these little extra things that you have to pay for. And all of a sudden, you're now probably $2 back behind where you could have been in another hospital that wasn't going to pay you just quite as much. And I get it. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, water, shelter. But just don't be afraid to ask the recruiter all of those fine details. I'm going to pause for a second because we're getting, we have like seven minutes left. I told you I could just keep talking. Any questions from anybody? No? Okay. We'll keep talking. Um, closing out the email, like you close out the interview, you've asked about the, you've asked about the timeline, and now you're going to send a thank you note. Maybe there's four or five people you're sending that thank you note to, whether it's handwritten or an email. If it's email, be very careful that you don't repeat the exact same words to the exact, all the people. Because we get excited. We're like, oh, they sent me an email. Oh, they really had a great time. And then we find out that they sent the exact same email to everybody. So they just cut and pasted and they didn't put in the original thought in it. And then we're sad because we don't feel special anymore. It's kind of stupid, but that happens. So thank, you know, thank people for the interview. Tell them why you really enjoyed talking with them. If you can make it personal to the person you're writing it to, that's fantastic. So I think I've covered, oh, I know something else. Oh, here we go. Questions. Sure. So um, if you're starting a residency program, but you've got like a day or two that you've got to go to like, I don't know, your sister's wedding or your brother's wedding or whatever, but you have an event that you have to go to, I think it's okay to talk to the recruiter about that, but I wouldn't mention that during the panel. Now, three-week trek, you know, as soon as the planes open up again and you can get on a plane and go out, then you want to go trekking to Nepal. You probably need to do that before the residency starts, because you're not going to be able to take those three weeks off in the middle of a nurse residency. The training programs don't last, you know, a whole year, but the nurse residency is a whole year long, so it's expected that you will have some time off. Um, and the actual residency part is usually just once a month, so be cognizant of those days, and hopefully you can make that work. One other thought about um, one other thought about the interview. I, I, I'm always going to remember to say this. You could be in the middle of telling the best story in the whole wide world, and you're so excited, and then you start cheering up because it's an emotional story. And if you're in person, we're not going to hug you anymore, but we'll hand you a tissue, and we're going to, you're going to, we're going to feel bad for you. We're going to give you a moment. We're going to let you collect your thoughts, but we're not going to hire you. 
I've seen it happen. I had an ED new grad who started crying in the middle of the interview. And back then we were, oh, we're so sorry. We gave him a hug and we left her go on her way. As soon as she walked out the door, the educator said, well, I'm not going to hire her. She's crying in an interview. What is she going to do when the, you know, the, it's the fan? So just be cognizant of things like that. You might think you're sharing and that it's wonderful and you feel so connected to these people, but then that might backfire on you completely. And I know you didn't mean to start crying, but just don't tell a story where you're, where you're going to tear up. Uh, I think I have covered almost everything I can. And again, happy to look and review at your resumes and cover letters. Any other questions for me that are out there, Ms. Kelly or with Rachel? Teresa, I don't see any other Okay. I also am cognizant of Yeah, I have, a, I have a meeting at one, so we have three minutes to spare. So again, people can reach out to me. If you all could share my contact information with the folks, happy to uh, follow up with anybody. Great. We will be following up with all the as well as mine too. So thank you. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs>